Thursday night in our small group meeting, I reiterated something from my past that uh, they found hard to believe and most people do. I am not an extrovert. I am very much an introvert. I was asked to have a solo at a previous church and I said I would rather preach three sermons than to sing a solo. When Barbara first met me, she and a good friend of hers thought it would be fun to run me into a broom closet just threatening to kiss me. And I ran into the broom closet and held the door shut and they were both on the outside. They did confess later that if I had said yes, they both would have ran. But it made a good story. Um, what are the, this is a chance for you to be a part of the sermon, okay? What are the key elements of your walk with Christ? Consistency. Uh, I am consistently bad. Daily devotions get a little deeper for me. Okay. Read your Bible and pray. And we, like our pastor said, we're told those things and then we're not given much information on how to do those things. I've had a number of people over the years said, you know, I don't know how to pray or I can't pray. And the simple, simple answer to that is, do you know how to talk to your wife? Do you know how to talk to a child? Do you know how to talk to your parent? Do you know how to talk to a friend? If you do, then you know how to pray. You really do. There is no holy language that we are supposed to use. You know, you, there's not a formula per se. I'm, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but I want you to turn as we open to Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to read it from the New English Translation. It's a Bible put together in 2019, so it's a newer translation. But I want you to read it in your translation. I believe we bring our Bibles to church to use. I don't believe they're, you know, an added piece of our clothing. Uh, 1957, when I first started attending church, I'd never heard about the Holy Spirit. The only time I'd ever heard about God is a swear word. And they wouldn't let me use those in church, Tom. Uh, they frowned on that pretty heavy. But it became important to me to learn how to read it. And all of those these and thous and things, they, they confused me and I didn't understand. And goest and saidest and all of that stuff, it just wrapped me up where I couldn't really enjoy it. Now this morning as we watched Mission Spotlight, we heard a song sung and I didn't count, but there must have been at least 20 different languages that that song was sung in. And I'm glad that I have a Heavenly Father who heard every one of those languages and understood every word that was in that song. And around the circle of this world as the Sabbath is being kept, God's children are praying and worshiping and God understands every one of you as if you were the only person that was speaking to him. Uh, I've got to the place in life where if you want to talk to me, please get my attention first. Say Pete, and I'll look at you, and then I can hear what you're saying. Uh, as a younger person, I could hear three or four people talk, and I might catch enough out of each of them to, to uh, maintain a conversation, but I can't do that anymore. So Ephesians 3, verses, starting at verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that according to the wealth of his glory, he will grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner person, that Christ will dwell in your hearts through faith, so that because you have been rooted and grounded in love, you will be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth and thus to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you will be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power that worketh within us is able to do far beyond all that we ask or think, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations 
forever and ever. Amen. That is one beautiful prayer, and you'll notice that it took about a minute, minute and a half to, to say, and that's public prayer. Now, private prayer, we're going to look at it a little bit from Jesus' point of view. How often did Jesus pray? Continuously. And the Father spoke back to him, and I, Barb reads to me stories on the way to church. You've heard that, me refer to that several times. And there's several of those people that hear God's instructions. I've never heard God's audible voice in my life. And this week I began looking at why. We're, we're reading for our small group a little book put out by Pavel Goya. And it's talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's something that he said that struck me that I'd never heard before, but something that I needed to hear. If I looked at you and I asked you 20 questions in a row, which one are you going to answer? If I talked to you for five minutes straight and you never had a chance to speak, you would think that I was lecturing you, right? Isn't that the way we approach prayer? We bow on our knees or we bow our heads and we, we have this prayer and it may be one minute long, it may be 20 minutes long but it is a lecture to God. And it made me stop and think, I don't have the right as a sinful being to lecture God about anything. I've seen some amazing answers to prayer and I've seen some major disappointments. Years ago, a good friend of ours, a cousin of my wife's, got married to a Methodist girl, and she wanted to know what it was he believed, so she began to study. And as she studied, every time she found something that she recognized as truth, she immediately put it in her life. It was a Friday afternoon, it was raining, and this young woman was about eight, eight and a half months pregnant, and she got in her Mustang and because of being so large, she didn't fasten her seatbelt and took off for town as always. She had some errands to run. Now back home, all of her husband's clothes and her clothes were set out for Sabbath morning. All the food for Sabbath was prepared and in the refrigerator and labeled. There was a fellowship lunch, so she had identified so that her husband wouldn't get into something that he wasn't supposed to get into. Any husbands recognize that? I can manage to do that on a regular basis, and my wife says, that was not for you. <laughs> we will never know this side of heaven what happened. But on a bridge on the way to town, she did three complete 360s and ran into the bridge backwards. She was thrown out of the driver's seat. This is a good pitch for wearing your seat belt, no matter how uncomfortable it is. She was thrown out of the driver's seat across the back of the bucket seat and into the back window. She expired on the way to town and so did her unborn child. And we prayed and we prayed and we prayed, not before we knew that she was dead. Lord, save this woman. She's such a light. She's such an example for the church around her, and God didn't answer. I've talked with people that have raised the dead to life. I've never, done, never been a part of one of those services, but I've been a part of anointing services where God has done some miraculous things. And it just amazes me that he would listen to me or to someone like me and actually heal another person. That's amazing to me. But God does that, and I've been amazed many times with that. But there are times when he said no. There are times when he said, I have something better. There are times when he says, not at this time. Wait a while. Things aren't right for me to do that. When I was in school, I hated history. I don't know, is there anyone else here like that? Memorizing all those dates and the things that happened. I mean, what did that really have to do with me? Not much, and so I struggled with it. But John Knox, I recognized from listening a little bit in history class, 
was a Protestant reformer in a Catholic nation. And Queen Mary said she feared the prayers of John Knox more than she feared all the armies of Scotland. John Wesley prayed and revival came to England, sparing the nation the hordes of the French Revolution. Jonathan Edwards prayed and revival spread through the American colonies. History has been changed time after time because people prayed. Dwight Moody said the power behind his sermons was not the words that he spoke, not the actions that he gave, but it was the people in the back room who were praying for him as he preached. Prayer is a weapon in the hands of God's people, but it's a weapon that, well, let me take you back a few years. I married into a family of hunters. I grew up in the city, and my next door neighbor, I could actually reach out the window and knock on her window. It wasn't safe to own a gun. So I didn't know anything about guns, and I'm riding with my future father-in-law, my girlfriend's father, and he hands me a 22 rifle, and he says, shoot that rabbit. I never shot a gun. He says, you got to take the safety off. What's a safety? I had no idea. But I finally figured out the safety, took it off, and I aimed at the rabbit and shot and missed him by a mile. Well, maybe only a few inches. But over the time, I learned how to aim that weapon and learned how to use it. The problem with us as Christians is we hear about prayer, we talk about prayer, we have theology about prayer, but we don't use it. And we need to open up our hearts to the possibility that God has more for us if we will use it. I was sitting alongside my father one day, father-in-law, and this man was showing a very expensive cutting torch. My father-in-law farmed, but he earned more money off his salvage business than he did off his farming. And he'd go around to different farm sales and buy things and tear them up and sell the, the parts for, their, for a very good price. The man went on for 40 minutes and finally he got down to the bottom line and he said, now this will only cost you and you can pay that in payments or you can make one check. And my father-in-law reached over and patted his bib overall. Some of you don't know what those are. You might have to go on Google and find a pair. And inside he pulled out his billfold and I knew what he carried. He carried $2,000 on him all the time and this is back in the 70s. All the time he had $2,000 and oftentimes he had $100 and $2 bills in his pocket because he could go to a person that he needed to pay, they needed to, let's see, they said they wanted $5 for it and he would offer them two twos and they would take the two twos over a $5 bill. They still make $2 bills and you can still get them from the bank, but most people don't know what they are. And my father-in-law looked at me and he said, if he wants it, I'll buy it for cash, but I don't need it. Your father is looking at you with the subject of prayer and he's saying, you need it and I'll give it to you free. All you have to do is come and ask. All power is given to me in heaven and earth, right? Isn't that the promise of Christ in 20, Matthew 28? All power, not a little power, not some power, not occasionally power, but all power. And it's available to us. Why aren't we taking advantage of it? Why is it that we use it only in emergencies? My youngest son drives a whole lot better than I ever do. He can take a car into two, two or three 360s and continue in the path that he was going. And he used that ability wrongly several times. One time on a 101 mile chase with the police after him. And a little bitty four cylinder, he was able to stay away from them because he knew how to drive. Do you have an enemy chasing you? Today, is there an enemy is seeking to devour you, seeking to separate you from the Father. Knowing how to pray is that, that tool that we have in order to get away from his power, his grasp. 
Dr. S.D. Gordon wrote a whole group of books on quiet talks. One of them is the quiet talks on prayer. And he says, the great people of the earth today are the people who pray. I do not mean those who talk about prayer, those who believe in prayer, nor yet those who can explain about prayer. I mean those people who take the time to pray. They have not the time. It must be taken from something else, often something that is important, very important and pressing even, but still less important and pressing than their need to pray. One of the things in this little book talks about being silent. How did Jesus pray all night? As a salesman, when I first started learning, I had a problem with one thing. The one was listening. I wasn't hearing what you were saying to me, and it's what you're saying to me that gives me the ability to sell you something. But I had another problem. When I ask you, do you see the value of this? I needed to be quiet. I needed to give you an opportunity to say yes, no, maybe. And it's in allowing you that little quiet time that you had the opportunity to really help me. Because I was asking you to take this little bitty stack of money and I was gonna give you this great big bunch of books for that little stack of money. God looks at us and he says, will you be quiet? And it really struck me looking at the story of Elijah. Elijah is on top of the mountain and he's praying. Did God answer his prayer? Miraculously? And everybody around knew that God had answered his prayer because here's lightning comes from heaven and it devours not only the sacrifice but the altar that it's on and actually vaporizes the water in the trench that they dug around it. Elijah runs from God instead of praying to God, and God finds him on a mountaintop. And there's a great earthquake. Is God in the earthquake? There's a great fire. Is God in, the earth, in that fire? But it's in a still... What has to happen for you to hear a still, small voice? And the hardest thing in the life of Americans and the first world nations today is learning to be quiet. We have televisions, we have radios, we have CDs, we have all kinds of gadgets that increase the noise. My wife and I are about the same age, and we have this problem that we hear the middles of words, but we don't often hear the beginning or the end of the word. And so we guess at what the other person is saying, and almost every time that I've done that, guess what? I guess wrong. And there's misunderstandings because I didn't hear the front of the word or the end of the word. Uh, I have a hearing aid that I have lost, it's been lost for almost a year and a half now. Looked everywhere for it, cannot find it. And wearing one, they tell me, is about as bad as not wearing it either. So I have an appointment with an audiologist to see if I can correct that problem. Quietness is unnerving. In between services, Somebody didn't get up to the desk immediately. And I saw you all squirm. I saw all of you looking to see what's going on, where, what's not happening, who's not doing. In a sales presentation that I gave one night, had a trainee with me. And I'd warned him, if I ask a question, do not answer for me or them. Just be quiet. So he pulled up his sleeve, and he starts watching his watch, and it was 45 seconds of quiet. And finally, the person looks at me and says, you know, I think I really do want those. And I began writing up the order, but 45 seconds is an eternity.
That's five seconds. And some of you are already getting uncomfortable at five seconds. And 45 seconds is a long time, but the, if I'm asking you a question, the most honest thing I can do is wait for you to answer. That was hard for me to learn as a salesperson. God is waiting for us to just be quiet so he can speak to us. Luke 3, 21 says, and while he, Jesus, was praying, the heavens opened up. That was at his baptism. He's gone through the sacred ceremony of being baptized, and he's standing on the banks, and he's just quiet. And he's praying. And as he prays, the heavens are opened up, and the Holy Spirit descends. Our greatest need in the church today is the Holy Spirit. It's our greatest need. It's the greatest tool that we have available to us, but it doesn't come when we just keep yapping. I love little dogs, but I can't stand little dogs. Little dogs, by and large, just yap, 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 and never quit. We have a neighbor that has a German shepherd, and he, doesn't, he isn't noisy unless somebody goes by the property that he doesn't recognize, and then immediately, it's bark, bark, bark. Mark 4.35 says Jesus got up early in the morning when it was still dark. He departed and went out to a deserted place, and there he spent time in prayer. There's a key there. One, when did he pray? Very early in the morning. Where did he pray? In a quiet place. I get distracted easy. Anybody else here like that? I get distracted really easy, and it's essential for me to find a quiet space. Now, several years ago, I had a kidney infection. They gave me an antibiotic, and it killed the infection, but it also gave me tinnitus. So I have a lifelong song playing, and they don't play the same tune, and they don't play at the same volume. It's annoying. But I have to get into a quiet place where I can, but every other time that I'm not praying, I've got to be in a noisy place. I have to go to sleep with a sound machine on because it allows my brain to focus on that noise rather than on this ringing. Um, unless you've ever gone through it, you don't understand what I'm talking about. Luke 6, as I looked at this, Luke talks more about Jesus in prayer than any of the other gospel writers. But Luke 6, verse 12, now it was during this time that Jesus went out to the mountain and he spent, what? All night. All night in prayer. Matthew 14 says, and he went and he sent the crowds away and he went up the mountain to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone and he prayed. And the disciples get in a boat and row out in the middle of the lake, and they're still trying to debate about who's greatest, and Jesus is praying. Who is the greatest? It was Jesus, wasn't it? And yet he's praying, and the others are bickering over whose positions in the church don't make any difference unless nobody steps up, as Steve said. When God calls you, as B.C. said, God enables you to fulfill that mission that he's called you. Elijah was called by Elisha, and he left his plow in the field after he'd burnt the thing and his oxen with it and left. The disciples on three different occasions were said, follow me, and they left their fishing boats and their nets and all of their income behind and followed him. There's times for us to spend all night in prayer. I'll tell you, I've spent a lot of time in prayer here this last week as I look at an $8,000 church deficit at this point, and I look at what that is going to cost us to fix the water damage in the hallways and those classrooms. We're not a rich church. We don't have deep pockets, but this is going to have to be fixed, and God will supply the need. And I need you as a church to be praying for that need to be filled. 
and the insurance adjusters to do their job and give us the best possible outcome. Uh, this morning I did something uncomfortable. I know our income and I, when we get paid I go on Adventist giving and immediately deduct 10% for our tithe. That doesn't belong to me, right? And then I take half of that amount and I turn it in for this church's budget. And I, my, the attorney who did our tax work said, you shouldn't do that. You don't really have that kind of money. To, but I don't have, I don't want to miss the blessing that I have by turning that in. This morning I reached into my pocket and I thought, well, I'll, I'll put an extra five in to help. And right next to it was a $10 bill. But there were two tens. I thought maybe that $5 bill was by itself and it might get lonesome, so I put in the 10. God nudges us, as my wife says, and when he nudges us, it's a responsibility of ours to respond. If we're actively praying God leads, how did Jesus know that when he walked under that sycamore tree, Zacchaeus was in that tree? The Tsar of Ages says his father told him that he'd be there. Why is it that Jesus, it is said of Jesus, he must go here? His father had told him. I long for that relationship, but I've prayed and prayed and I've never been quiet. And my wife says, if you'd asked for a kiss and you just kept asking, you probably would have never have gotten one. And it's true, we keep asking and asking, and asking is a part of that, but then there's a time for us to be quiet. If I regard iniquity in my heart, what happens? So it's a prerequisite of, of answered prayer for me to submit to my Father and allow Him to take out of my life that sin. Google says that word cherish, that's what's in the New English means to appreciate that sin, to treasure that sin, to hold that sin dear, to respect that sin, to adore that sin, to indulge in that sin, to spoil, and to indulge or to harbor that sin. Changes its meaning real quickly, doesn't it? Am I indulging my sin? I went in to see the heart doctor and he says, Pete, you're in pretty good health, but at 225 pounds, you're too big. You need to do something about that if you want to live longer. And so I went home and I said, you know, Barb, the, the doctor's telling me I need to reduce my size. I'm going to have to buy some new clothes because I've dropped from 225 down to 186. And my goal is 180 by June. And that will still put me about five pounds over where the doctor wants me. But I indulged myself too much too long and developed a size that was unhealthy to me. My neck size has gone down by about a half an inch. My belt, I had to cut new holes in my belt for it to be useful again. I indulged myself, I cherished that food, I loved that food, I treasured it, I held it dear to me. I love ice cream. We were driving to Shalot one day, and, and I said, does anybody want to stop at Dairy Queen? And from the back seat, my little granddaughter says, Grandpa, I love ice cream. <laughs> but it's been a while since I bought ice cream. One of the ways that Barb and I got together was I was sitting in the kitchen where I worked at the academy and the director said, Pete, I need you to take the buffer over to the boys' dorm. So I've got this buffer and I'm carrying it. I weigh 150 pounds at the time. And I'm taking this buffer across the street and as I get out the front door of the administration building, this voice says, would you buy me an ice cream sandwich? Now, I had a dollar bill in my pocket. That's like a $10 bill today. And 
I went over to the store and I spent 10 cents of that dollar bill to buy her an ice cream sandwich. Now, the moral of that story is that, not that I got the girls, but the moral of that story is I didn't have enough money to get the haircut that I was required to get that day. <laughs> the dean had to give me 10 cents so that I could get the haircut that he required I get. And then he told me, he said, that girl could have bought everybody in this school an ice cream sandwich and never missed this. What is it that God has waiting for you and I that he's not able to give us because we ask amiss? That we regard something in our life, we cherish that thing, we hold on to that thing, we desire that thing so much that God says, I can't do this. I can't give you this to use it that way. That's the thing that needs to happen in prayer is for the Lord to come. Luke 18, verses 13 and 14 is the story of the publican in prayer. And his prayer is short, and it's a prayer of contrition. He says, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. It is that humbleness that I pray for. We are taught in the Western society that it is best if I think highly of myself. And Jacob says, oh, worm that I am, I don't want you running around out of church today and saying, oh, well, I'm a worm. But I want you to recognize you're a child of God, but you don't deserve everything. You can't just go to God and say, hey, Santa Claus, or hey, Tooth Fairy. It is, I deserve death. That's the only thing I as a sinner deserve is, is eternal death. So I don't have any right to go to God and say, demand that he answer my prayer. I'm not omniscient. I'm not omnipresent. I don't know what's best. But I do know that my father will give me what's best if I ask for what's best. Just like my father-in-law said, I'll buy this for him if he wants it. Your heavenly father is saying, I'll give you this if you want it. So my prayer life has changed a little bit. I'm going and I'm saying there's this tree. It's got the fruit of the spirit. Steve, would you bring a blanket up here to the front row? There's this, this tree that has all of this fruit of the spirit. And I'm asking, give me this fruit. Make it flower in my life. Make it mature in my life. Make it edible in my life. God wants us to ask for the best things. And he's given us a good idea of what those best things are. You wouldn't think of just asking God for it, would you? And why not? Because you know you'd be asking for what you have no right to. You're a spoiled child. You want your own way. You're cheating on God. If you want it, if all you want is what is your own way of flirting with the world. Every chance you get, you end up enemies of God and the way. And you do, and do you suppose God doesn't care? The proverb has it that he's fiercely jealous. And what does he give in love is far better than anything else you find. That doesn't sound familiar to you, does it? But that's the Amplified Bible's version of James chapter 4, verse 4. Let me read it again for you. You wouldn't think of just asking God for it, would you? And why not? Because you know you'd be asking for what you have no right to. You're spoiled children, each wanting your own way. You're cheating on God. If all you want is your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up as an enemy of God in his way. And do you suppose God doesn't care? The proverb has it that he's fiercely jealous and what he gives in love is far better than anything else you'll find. It's common knowledge that God goes against the willfully proud. God gives grace to the willing humble. At Academy, we had this young man who was a year ahead of us. He was terribly strong. I'd watched him do a handstand with his feet up against the wall and do 20 push-ups. 
That's his whole body. That's not just his chest that he's pushing up. But he never was in a, in a fight. He was never in a disagreement. And that kid could wander off campus and he could go to town seven miles away and come back right in front of the deans and they never said a word to him. But if I got six inches off the campus, I was going to get in trouble. And I couldn't figure out the difference. And the difference is he humbly went to the dean and had said, I need to go get this part for my go-kart that I'm building. And the dean let him go. When I wanted to go off campus, it was to satisfy something that I wanted to do, not something that I really should have been doing. So this thing of being humble is part of the way that God answers us. God longs to cleanse us. He longs to restore us to a right relationship. He caught Elijah running from him, and he caught him in a cave, and he gave him forgiveness. He gave him cleansing and he restored him to the fight. He gave him a mission. God caught Peter running to the Garden of Gethsemane, pouring his heart out that he had failed his, his servant, his savior, Jesus. He had used God's name wrongly. Now, keep in mind that you don't have to say four-letter words to use God's name wrongly. The other day, we were checking out at Walmart, and we buy our water in gallon jugs that we refill. And I had stuck six of these gallon jugs in my cart and I had checked everything out. And as we're going out the door, my wife said, did you bring up water? And I said, I think I did. We got home, looked at the receipt, I did not. So the next time into Walmart, I rang up six one gallon jugs of water, but I had no jugs in my basket. Being honest is your choice. If you regard iniquity, God cannot, will not answer. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Pride is a hard thing for me to admit. But I get rather stubborn at times. I have a little English in me and a little German in me and a little Hungarian in me and this little voice in me says, it's all right this time, but it never is. One of the best humble stories that I know is the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar stands on the wall. He's had a warning from God that if he doesn't change his life, he's going to suffer the consequences. But Nebuchadnezzar comes out and he says, oh, this great city that I have built. And it sounds like a, a portion of Isaiah's description of Lucifer. I, 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 and I have rights and I have wants and I have desires and I have needs. And God says, you have a right to be my child. And he humbles Nebuchadnezzar and allows him to act like an animal for a period of time. Lord, correct me, but don't make me act like an animal. Take out of my life that which separates me from you. Take out of my life that which would not make me happy in heaven. How would I live with the angels of heaven who have never sinned and want my way all the time? Would they be happy with me? Would I be happy there? I need that, that extraction. Uh, years ago, having been born in England during the last days of the war, um, I didn't get a lot of calcium, not much at all. And what I did get was ground up eggshells. I've never been able to grind up eggshells fine enough not to notice that they were there. So I went to see the dentist and he says, this tooth just broke off. And I'm gonna to have to extract the root. Lord, be my dentist. I don't want this sin broken off. I want it extracted. I want the desire for it to be gone. I don't want to treat it as my pet anymore. 
I want it to be my enemy. I want to feel like it's my enemy. Forgiveness is one of the other things that stops God from really doing what he wants to do. As long as I have a problem with you, as long as I cannot forgive you, God says, wait a minute, why, why are you asking me for forgiveness? But if you're like me, it's not my, my problem with forgiving people. I forgive people fairly quickly, but the problem is forgiving me. Nobody else is like that here. I beat myself up pretty regularly for things that I say or do. I don't have a great memory. And I forget what I, what I say, and sometimes I do something different than what I've said, and I feel bad about it. So learning to forgive me and learning to forgive you is one of those things that is a prerequisite of what God has learned. Nancy, a little bit ago, said persistence. Psalms 126.5 says, Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. Being consistent. The widow who went and said to the judge, Honor my request. Honor my request. Honor my request. I tell you, Jesus said, that God will, that the judge will honor that just to get her out of the courtroom. And that's the way it is with you and I. If we keep praying, God is going to listen, and it gives him. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17. This is what I'm going to say to you in closing. I don't have a big appeal. I just want to let you know that persistence draws us into the presence of the one who wants to love on you throughout eternity. It is your persistence that teaches you how to share your heart's deepest needs and feels. So in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17, it says, Rejoice how often? Pray without? Give. In what circumstances? For this is the, the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Almighty Father, we pause here at this end of the service. And we rejoice that we have been forgiven. We give thanks that you have taught us to be forgivers. That you have taught us that we can come to you and you will answer our prayers. When we wake up, when we go to sleep, when we eat, when we go on a trip, when we're with family members or strangers, when we're at church or in our hiding places, may our joys be known by you, may our tears be understood by you, and may we always be in the will of God in Christ Jesus, we pray in your son's name, amen.